Welcome, everyone. I'm Aaron Smith. I'm joined by Nancy Bakeman, and this is the EBA webinar podcast series. And today we're pleased to be joined by Doug Walter, who is presenting on high performance home lighting for health, safety, and welfare. We will uh, have the Q&A section open. Uh, please put any questions that you have there, and we will take those at the end of the session. Doug, it's so great to have you with us today. Thank you, Aaron. Really glad to be here. Um, let's dive right in. The uh, Now, it's funny, since I'm talking to the Energy Efficient Building Association, that I will tell you that we've gone about as far as we can in terms of energy savings. Today, we can get the same amount of light out of a 20-watt LED as we used to get out of a 100-watt halogen. It's a, a wonderful revolution in lighting that's happened over the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, so really, what we're going to talk about today is mainly about the quality of light, which is absolutely as important as the quantity of light. Um, things like the new well building standard have a huge uh, section on circadian stimulus and equivalent, equivalent mel melanopic lux. And we're gonna talk about those kind of things today. Uh, light is to architecture what sound is to music, said uh, San Diego Calatrava, which is true. I mean, we see, we experience the world mainly through our eyes. And without light, there is no architecture. Um, so these are our four learning objectives. We're gonna learn how to maximize lighting and daylighting to support circadian rhythms. Uh, we're gonna understand why each user has different needs um, based on their age and, and preference. We're gonna look at the current residential lighting standards and industry recommendations uh, with a critical eye and uh, allow you to make your own decisions about what uh, metrics you should follow. And then finally, we're gonna end up with giving you some resources to uh, further your learning on this topic if you're interested. Well, with, and there's particular focus on kitchens and baths because those are the two most critical uh, illumination uh, environments in the home. So this is the outline of what we're gonna do in the next hour. Uh, we have a lot of slides queued up. We're going to go very, very fast. Um, and if we do run short on time to answer all the questions, I, I have my email at the end. I encourage you to email me with those questions, and I will methodically uh, answer each and every one. Uh, so how bad is lighting in the typical home? It is horrible. Uh, I would say there's not a kitchen I measure before we do a remodel that's over 20 foot candles. And the very bare minimum for a kitchen work surface is 50 foot candles. And seniors need twice that, around 100 foot candles. And it all starts with the code, which is such a low bar. Um, in section E3903, it says there should be a, uh, a light in every room. Uh, but then there's an exception saying, if it's not a kitchen or bath, uh, you don't have to even do a light, you just do a switched plug that someone could put their own lamp in. And then in kitchens and bathrooms, they only require one light, that's it. Um, and that's why you see builders building houses with very few lights, because they don't have to. Um, some of the industry publications uh, for years have been uh, suggesting laying out lighting something like this. This is a tracing from a a book, not that particular book, um, but you see the lights are kind of out in the middle of the space. They're about four feet off the wall. The only one that's actually doing any useful work is the one over the sink. Um, here is a measurement of uh, foot candles on the countertop of a client who had just done a very expensive kitchen remodel. Uh, however, if you look at their lights, they're out in the middle of the aisleways. So at the sink, I was getting 6.8 foot candles, which is far less than the 50 or 100 uh, required. So let's delve into to vision because that's how we perceive light and uh, our environment. It, it's totally dependent on light. It's one of our primary uh, senses and 80%, maybe 90% of new learning is through our eyes. That's why light and vision are terribly important. Uh, when our eyes are open, two thirds of the electrical activity of the brain is devoted to vision. Um, and it has an intricate relationship with circadian rhythm and sleep cycle and health. 
uh, so the very basic function of light is make it light enough to see. It makes it safer, decreases falls and accidents, reduces eye strain, reduces stress, and it improves mood. Improves mood. Um, now, the problem is that almost 13% of Americans have some form of serious vision loss. And that's a huge percentage, which compare it to half of 1% of Americans who have mobility challenges requiring them to use wheelchairs or electric scooters. And yet, um, with ADA requirements and things, we do an enormous amount for people um, in wheelchairs. And we do almost nothing for uh, the vision impaired, the low vision community in particular. And why this is, is partly because of the aging demographic. Um, in 1900, the average lifespan was 47 years. Today, it's around 76. And with age comes a very natural degradation of the lens of the eye. These are actual uh, lenses of, uh, uh, from, uh, I guess, autopsies from people from six months to 91 years. And you can see what starts out as a crystalline lens by the time you're in your late 40s and certainly by your 60s, it's starting to get yellow and then even brown as you get up into your uh, uh, ninth decade. And, and not only does it get uh, increasingly yellowed, the lens gets thicker and the pupils gets, get narrower, get smaller as you age. And all that conspires to reduce light reaching the retina. Now, the good news is, and they've done studies where um, they compared a young and an old person uh, and their visual performance in a, at low light levels, uh, there's a vast difference. It's like a three times uh, difference. And yet the good news in this chart is as you increase the illumination, the visual acuity of the senior almost equals that of a young person. So, Along with the, the uh, darkening lenses, we have these other uh, uh, visual problems, the contrast sensitivity, the visual field restriction, uh, limited acuity and a slow adaptation from light to dark, uh, increased depth, uh, uh, reduced depth perception, increased glare sensitivity. Uh, and on top of that, then we have certain conditions that uh, like macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and cataracts that conspire to make uh, vision even more challenging. So the first function of light is for safety and function. Uh, the, the whole talk is titled uh, Light for Health, Safety, and Welfare because that's the basis uh, of any of our licenses, whether you're an architect, a contractor, um, if you have a license from the state or, or your local community, there's something in there that's gonna say, protect the public health, safety, and welfare. So the problems with uh, vision impairment is uh, increased fall risk. Uh, and with that comes increased risk for broken bones, uh, increased risk of depression, social isolation, um, and cognitive impairment uh, can happen with decreased vision or decreased hearing for that matter. Um, so the question then becomes how much light is enough? Well, there's uh, fortunately there's an organization, um, the Lighting uh, Professionals in Illuminating Engineering Society of, of which I'm a member, and they put out uh, guidelines for what's the basic level of illumination for different parts of the home. And, and here we have it. Uh, obviously the kitchen is the highest. Um, Laundry is pretty high as well. Bathrooms uh, fairly high. Um, and let's talk a little bit about falls in the home. One in three seniors falls uh, each year. 95% uh, of hip fractures are caused by falls. They mostly happen descending the stair. Uh, and that's where most deaths and serious injuries occur. So uh, things we can do with lighting that would help that uh, further statistics, about 12,000 Americans die each year from falls on the stairs. Um, so one of the most effective things we could do is provide natural and artificial lighting on all our stairways. So here was one project that we did a couple years ago that we have one two by four skylight at the top of that uh, stair and it just utterly transformed 
the experience of using those stairs during the day. Uh, we also added qu quite a bit more um, electric lighting as well. Um, uh, Dr. Mariana Figueroa is a very uh, prominent researcher in the field of uh, uh, light and particularly seniors. And this was a test room she did with amber lighting, which is uh, very kind on uh, uh, the eyes at night uh, in a uh, test facility, outlining a door to make it easy to see and uh, under the bed and things like that. Uh, so here are the four things that we can do as architects, designers, builders, to help with vision impairment. Raise the overall ambient light level as much as possible. Uh, at the same time, be sure to reduce glare and shadow. And that sounds somewhat uh, contradictory, but, but it's not if you pay attention. Increase contrast. And that's um, particularly for people with, who are, are challenged with vision. Uh, so that would mean don't do an all white bathroom, you know, make sure the grab bar is a different finish than the, the wall tile and the floor tiles are darker than the wall tile, things like that. And then finally, give your viewer control. And that means giving them uh, multiple options for light, layers of lighting and give them dimming capabilities as well. Um, so let's dive into lighting uh, products themselves because a light is not a light. All lights are very, very different. Uh, you go to the local big box store and you have an aisle that's about a half a block long of just every possible kind of light, including the old technologies, the fluorescent and even halogens. Um, and it's very hard for a consumer uh, and even for some professionals to figure out what's the right light. I'm going to try to uh, help you make that decision. The, there are two basic types of um, uh, when, when talking about recessed cans, which is kind of the workhorse of the lighting that we typically do, you can either do a dedicated JA8 fixture on the right, uh, and that's required in California and Washington state, uh, but everywhere else you still have the option of doing a standard uh, can with a, a socket that you can screw in an LED uh, lamp, and that's what we do mostly. Um, so every light that is sold has a, a lighting fax a label, sort of like a nutrition label for food. This is the one for lamps, and it tells you how bright it is in lumens, uh, the estimated yearly cost, the life of it, and the light appearance, uh, the color temperature. In this, this case, uh, 3000 uh, Kelvin for the LED on top. And notice the, the estimated yearly cost is uh, $1.26 versus 638 for the halogen version and the lifespan is 22 times longer. Um, so here's just a simple example. This was a standard bungalow kitchen. There's one overhead light. Uh, the clients had added some fluorescent under cabinet lighting. Uh, we relit this kitchen. You see the plan on the right. Uh, the down lights are basically over the the countertop as close as we could to where you're going to be working. We kept the ceiling fixture as a uh, ambient light source on a separate switch. And that's the one light you might turn on if you're going in late at night to get a glass of water or something like that. So anyway, this thing was built and I went back a couple of months later and, and, and saw what was on the left. And it was, a, uh, it was not what I had intended. The, the lights were very glary. I was standing in the dining room and I was getting light in my eyes. And so I went over and took out a, a, a bulb and it was a, uh, what's called a BR. 30 bulb, and I had spec'd par 30 bulbs. Uh, it was only putting down 15.4 foot candles on the, the countertops. You notice a lot of the light is up at the top of that upper cabinet. You see the glare up there, and then it gets darker as it goes down. On the right is what happened when I put in a, a par 30 that I had with me in my car, and same lumens, uh, about 900 or 1,000 lumens, same wattage. And I was getting basically 10 times the light as well as a better quality of light. You can see the countertops are much, much brighter and the colors are rendered a lot truer. Um, you know, they probably don't run these at 158 foot candles, um, but they have dimmers on everything so they can put it exactly how they want it. Uh, so in choosing your lamps uh, or your fixtures, 
be sure to find ones that have photometric charts. They're your best friends. Um, basically, this tells you how much light is going to be delivered uh, at each uh, distance from the source, because lumens only tell you how much light's coming out up here. We don't care so much about that. We care about what's going to be delivered on the work surface, whether it's a countertop or a table or a couch. Uh, in this case, uh, you see on that chart on the right, at six feet from the source. So that would be like an eight foot high ceiling in a kitchen with a three foot countertop. Uh, I would have 131 foot candles, which is well above what I need. And it would have a beam diameter of 2.7 feet. Uh, and the beam diameter helps you space your, your cans. Um, my colleague, uh, Karen Judd Riley says, if the fixture you're looking at doesn't have photometric charts, find another manufacturer. And I would agree. So let's, let's delve into kitchen lighting in particular, and let's talk about kitchen lighting that actually works. Uh, why is it important? Because this is the one room in your house that you're not only checking foods for freshness and whether they're spoiled or not, but you're doing fine tasks with very sharp implements. Um, so if I just went on the web and typed in laying out kitchen lighting, these were four of the first images that came up and every one of them is wrong. Uh, the only light that's doing any work is the one over the sink. Everything else is just lighting the floor to help you mop it. Um, all the, the text uh, from NKBA or IES tell you that the light should not be uh, over the user's head or behind the, the head. They need to be over the work surface. So I wanted to test this out. So I bought some fixtures and lamps. And uh, this was a client of mine, a house we were remodeling and uh, I tried different uh, lamps at different di distances from the wall. So here I am with a light three feet out from the wall and without him standing there, I had 27 foot candles, which is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. But when he stood there, obviously everything's in shadow. <coughs> and it dropped to just a little more than one foot candle. So this was the, light kit that I started out with. And I've got now two milk crates of these things. I lug around to different clients' houses and try out um, lights to show them what to expect. Um, this was a test I was doing at another client's house with my colleague, Jenny Finnegan. Um, again, charting lights at, at different distances from the work surface. And we made a chart out of that, the, the different types of bulbs we were experimenting with at the top. Um, the distance from the wall with and without the cook. And you can see the bottom line that 48 inches out from the wall, that the most I was getting was a 1.2 foot candles. And this is, this is basically what one of the uh, industry texts was recommending. Uh, 24 inches, I, I was doing better. I, I got up to 80 foot candles with the cook standing there. Um, here's a very recent project we did. Uh, the old kitchen is on the left, and you couldn't really tell what the cabinets were. Um, it was builder grade uh, BR38 lamps and, and slope ceiling fixtures. Um, and the average foot candle reading on the countertop was about 16. Uh, after we did our relamping, we got it to 126. We added, I think, two down lights. We changed the location from in the middle of the aisle to over the countertops. We also did continuous LED under cabinet lighting and LED up lighting to take advantage of that ceiling. Uh, the lighting textbook by NKBA has a couple of sections uh, that tell you to locate it directly over the task. Um, and then the question comes up is how do you measure foot candles, well, you don't have to go by a light meter, although they're ridiculously expensive now. The, the first one I ever bought, I think was $200. Last one I bought was $29. There are free apps for your phone that you can get. I use Light Meter Pro and Light Companion uh, because you always have your phone. You're not always gonna have your light meter. Uh, you need to check what your kitchens uh, in particular are delivering. Um, and then I get the objection, well, but we have under cabinet lights. Well, they're not always going to do the job. You know, you don't have under cabinet lights at an island or at a window. Um, and this was just a test of two different types of under cabinet lights. And the, the most I was getting out of them was 
15 to 20 foot candles. Uh, there are high, high output versions of under cabinet lights uh, available, thankfully, that you can get closer to 50, 80, maybe foot candles. So this is another study, um, a long distance consult I did for Joanne in Maryland. Um, and this was her kitchen before. Um, 23, 20, the highest reading we had was 41. Uh, be, uh, these X's are where we measured the foot candle level. At the sink, she only had 23 foot candles. The, the, the before picture doesn't look bad. Uh, you're getting light on the upper cabinets, but you're getting very little light down on the countertops. And unfortunately, the countertop uh, was a dark uh, uba tuba granite that sucked up uh, any extra light. So this was a lighting plan uh, I did for her. We put the lights over the countertop. Uh, we added some down lights at the sink in addition to the uh, pendants that she had on a separate switch. Um, and this is uh, the fixture we ended up using, which was a dedicated LED from Lightelier. It was a three inch one. Uh, Joanne had the, the advantage of, of a brother who's an electrician and he, uh, at my suggestion, went out and bought one of these and wired it up and, and they tried it out in the space before they ordered the rest of them. Um, so this was the reading afterwards, just with the down lights, anywhere from 79 to 118 foot candles. Uh, but then the real uh, showstopper was when he put in the under cabinet lights, because he didn't do just one row of LEDs, he did a double row of LEDs, and we got her readings uh, uh, anywhere from 115 to 182 foot candles. And, and this, uh, Joanne's a, a senior who has a real need for lighting. I, I asked her before we uh, did the work, I said, where in your house do you have enough light? And she sent me a picture of her sewing setup, which had the light from the machine, which put out about 50 foot candles, but then she had a gooseneck lamp and the total reading there was about 270. So I knew that she needed high levels of illumination. And, and I would uh, say that my personal experience with lighting for seniors is that uh, 100 is, is uh, not too much. The, some of them prefer closer to 150. Um, and she was very happy with the result. Uh, um, but don't forget in all this discussion of electric lighting, the best and the cheapest source of light, the sun. Uh, maximize daylight wherever possible. In this particular kitchen, we enlarged the window about 30%. We also then carved out um, space from the attic for a uh, three skylight uh, uh, well in the ceiling to bring that daylight in. Um, so if we're talking about a circadian supporting kitchen, uh, daylight's a big factor. This happens to be an interior uh, kitchen. There's no outside, well, I won't say there's no outside light. We're behind a photographer in this picture. There's a sliding door out to the side yard, but uh, basically there's no, a window. Uh, we used skylights, track lighting, recess cans, under cabinet lights, recess cove lighting up lights the, the coffer, and then they all have a, a warm dim capability that takes them from 3000, the normal operating uh, color temperature down to 1800, which is kind of a, a sunset kind of feel. Um, same concept, basically, but this is just two two by four skylights in a, in a trust roof ceiling that just transformed this kitchen. Um, so it, it, we promised to talk about all the rooms in the house. So let's talk about baths and other rooms. Um, it's terribly important again in bathrooms to have good lighting for safety because that's where most falls happen in the house is the bathroom. Uh, we're doing shaving and things with sharp objects. And then we're sometimes we're choosing medications and trying to figure out the, is that a blue pill or is it a green pill? Um, so you want to do maximize daylighting. In this case, we added skylights. We have windows over the tub. We did sconces flanking the mirrors, which is the, the best place for them to bring light evenly to either side of the face. Um, and then we added a few down lights. Um, and this was another bathroom we did where we chose not to do windows because the neighbor was like 10 feet away, but we did a, a huge skylight uh, a monitor on the roof with, with eight skylights. Uh, and this was a, a bathroom remodel in a basement. And I brought a, 
solar tube or sun tunnel down through the first floor to the basement. And when I turned off the lights that particular day, I took this picture, I was getting 37 foot candles of natural light in that basement bath. Um, bedrooms is, is another critical lighting environment, particularly because we're trying not to over light. We're trying to, to give warm colors. We're trying to give dimming capabilities. And in this case, um, is a very large room that was kind of relentlessly flat ceiling. So we went ahead and created this uh, coffer in the ceiling, which we're then able to uplight. And then we have a few strategic downlights as well. So the indirect lighting is particularly nice. It, it doesn't, there's no chance of it glaring uh, in the eye. Uh, the same kind of uplighting situation for a living room. Uh, in this case, we have cove light uplighting. We have down lighting and we have decorative fixtures. So we have three different circuits of lighting that they can play with to adjust it to the activity and uh, their preference. Uh, here's another relighting we did a couple months ago uh, on a ranch house. You can see in the hallway, we added one more recess can, which really uh, helped them navigate. And that one down light that we added over the stairway to basically light the art on the left-hand wall has the side benefit of making that stairway a whole bunch safer. This was a view kind of looking the other way. I, you know, I had art that was kind of in shadow on two walls. So we dedicated a um, adjustable uh, LED to each piece of art so that the walls are lit. It's very important to light vertical surfaces. It makes uh, for a much more comfortable environment. Uh, also notice that we did a, a down light over the couch before they were just relying on table lamps for their light. And then they had some track lighting down at the fireplace. Uh, closets, uh, again, it's important that you have enough light and you have a good quality light, which is measured in measured in CRI, uh, it's a color rendering index and you want something 90 or above. Um, this is a, a, just a couple small closets where there, there weren't lights before, but we added LEDs. So suddenly they're not fishing in the dark um, to, to find their clothes and things. Uh, breakfast rooms and dining rooms uh, are terribly important. Uh, here we had a, a breakfast room that had one kind of faux shan uh, antler chandelier. That was it for the, the table. We did a new chandelier, but and notice there, there's also an adjustable downlight on either side of the chandelier that's not on in this picture, but it's designed specifically to light the table so that you can have the chandelier on very dim and then the downlights will actually punch up the table. And then we did a lot of uh, wall lighting to help uh, light the art and light the walls in the room. So let's get into the circadian um, uh, section of our talk, and that's how important light is for biological function. It's the primary energy source for all existence on Earth. Um, before we had electric lights, uh, daylight set our work schedules and our school schedules. A lot of the old schools had huge windows, and of course, uh, by the time the 1970s came around, they were doing schools without windows because they were distracting to the students, but they're also deadly, uh, deadly dull environments to be in. My kids went to a school like that. Um, there's a theory uh, by uh, Professor Wilson of Harvard called biophilia that you've heard about. It's kind of a feeling of well-being. Uh, just from being connected with the outdoors, I, either through a view or even a photograph or a poster, um, it's very calming, and it's something that, that we should be aiming for. Uh, it's certainly been proven that daylight improves mood and reduces seasonal affective disorder. It also is important in providing vitamin D, uh, which enhances health. Um, and lack of vitamin B uh, of D uh, from reduced daylight in northern climates has been associated with uh, multiple sclerosis and other things. So it's very important that we get light uh, on our skin as well as our eyes. Um, a, a recent study, uh, 2018 Harvard Business Review, the number one office perk when people were 
uh, polled was uh, access to natural light and views. Uh, major league sports teams uh, pay attention to this and they have their uh, locker rooms and sometimes the jets that they use uh, set to uh, uh, mimic the, the light uh, outside. And what's interesting about uh, daylight is it's dynamic. It's changing every minute of the day and every day of the year. It's only similar on two days a year on either side of the uh, 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 you know the winter and the December was it twenty first and June twenty uh, first. Solstice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, this circadian research uh, has yielded some, yielded some interesting things. This was, um, Jenny Craig had a program called Rapper's Results and was based on Dr. Emily Mangunian's research uh, saying that basically you wanna finish eating about 10 hours after you get up. And that was the whole trick in uh, rapid weight loss. Uh, so let's get further into circadian rhythms. And this is particularly, we're talking about non-visual effects of light um, because we have rods and we have cones, but it was only 25 years ago or so that they discovered there are photoreceptors in the retina that have nothing to do with vision. They're called IB, IPGRCs. Um, and there are actually, I think five kinds of IPGRCs in the retina. They only know what one does. And that one is this one we're talking about right now. Um, because it's sending messages to something called the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, which then regulates all your hormones and all the organs in your body. Um, so every, every part of your body is affected uh, by circadian stimulus. So there, there's the SCN in the middle of the brain. And it's stimulated by different wavelengths of light. And in particular, the um, alerting effect of uh, morning to noon light. It's a blue in the 400 to 500 nanometer range, about 480, I think is kind of the peak sensitivity. And it's very, very important to get that uh, on the retina in the morning to set uh, your day to get the cortisol stimulated and the melatonin suppressed. But it's equally important in the late afternoon is to start cutting down on the intensity of the light and the color of the light um, to go more to the six to 700 nanometer range of light uh, to, to increase melatonin production and get ready for sleep. And then the third part of this equation that people don't often talk about is nighttime darkness, true darkness is just as important as the light during the day. And uh, if you look around your room after you turn out the lights tonight, I bet you're gonna find light from your uh, uh, alarm clock, from the cable box, from your heating pad, uh, CPAP, whatever you have, little lights all around the room. It's pretty important to uh, minimize those, particularly if they're in the blue range. Uh, you can take like red duct tape and put them over those uh, lights and uh, turn them into something more benign or, or just eliminate the source altogether. It, it's been shown convincingly that with daylight, uh, patients in hospitals recover faster, students get better grades, office workers are more productive, depression's reduced, and shoppers buy more. Those are all good things. Um, it involves sleep and wakefulness, uh, growth, blood pressure, uh, your stress response, your, your metabolism, your core body temperature. Um, so these are some of the diseases across the lifespan that uh, have been related to circadian disruption. Um, it's such an important topic that the Nobel Prize in 2017 in medicine went to three researchers who uh, were uh, researching controlling circadian rhythms. Now, what's interesting is up until last year, I used to think that just sitting by a window and getting some daylight was going to give you a beneficial effect. But 
uh, I went to a session at Light Fair, which is the annual conference for lighting geeks, and uh, found out that the uh, low E coating we put on inside of all our windows uh, for energy efficiency also cuts out 95% of the beneficial ultraviolet rays that we need to trigger the circadian effect. So, and this has particular consequences like in uh, continuing care facilities where uh, you want seniors who don't get out much to, to get some light. Um, you're not gonna get that circadian effect if they're inside, they have to be outside. Um, it, it will give you the, the um, biophilic effect uh, but it won't give you the circadian effect. So we need to get outside in the mornings, take off the sunglasses and soak up daylight. So here are two groups of people who do get sufficient morning light, the dog walkers and smokers. They're both outside um, soaking up daylight. Uh, my friend Nancy Clanton uh, from Boulder, a lighting designer, uh, advises people to go outside and take a lumen shower every morning or at least stand by a window. Now, what's wrong with that picture, that stock picture I put there of the young lady with the headphones and the sunglasses is sunglasses are not gonna help. Um, but you also shouldn't be looking at the sun. You really need to be looking away from the sun at that blue sky because that's the color temperature uh, that triggers circadian response, uh, uh, daylight, not sunlight. Uh, she is getting vitamin D, however, through her skin. Now, when someone's got sleep disorders and goes to a sleep doctor, they may be, uh, outfitted with a decimeter, which is called, he's wearing that around his neck, and it measures equivalent melanopic lux and circadian stimulus, which is are both measurements that the well-building standard pays a lot of attention to. You get extra points for providing everybody with sufficient uh, circadian stimulus. Um, and you can tell how well you're getting uh, your circadian stimulus by your, your sleep. Um, it, darkness is just as important as light. Um, you know, be careful of uh, obviously your smartphones and your computers and your TVs before bedtime. Uh, again, back to some of the effects of disrupted circadian rhythm, uh, decreased creativity and productivity, anxiety, depression, weight gain, um, not good stuff. So here's the vicious cycle, particularly when it comes to continuing care facilities. Circadian disruption leads to poor sleep, which leads to uh, deposits in the brain and inflammation, which leads to Alzheimer's progression. And Alzheimer's progression leads to poor sleep. Um, older adults have decreased sleep efficiency um, and a decrease in number of sleep cycles, which uh, all of which can lead to agitation sundowning, nighttime wandering, and accelerated cognitive design decline. Now, uh, Deborah Burnett, who's the lead researcher in the biologic effects of light, uh, said that she would suggest that sleep is the new yardstick for quantifying built environmental wellness outcomes. So here was a uh, presentation back in 2016 at Light Fair uh, by Bob Davis and Connie Sama about a test installation they did at a continuing care facility in Sacramento. They went in and they changed LED lights above the bed instead of the fluorescence uh, to a color changing light. They did the same color changing light on some light coves on three walls. They also added amber rope light under the beds on emotion sensors so that when the senior got out of bed and the foot hit the floor, this amber light would come on and help them navigate to the bathroom. So they run the room lighting around 6,000, which is a very blue daylight from 7 a.m. to two, drop it to 4,100 from two to six, and then 2,700 from six to eight. And then they did a similar thing um, on the hallways. And then they, they dimmed them down greatly from six in the, in the evening to seven in the morning. This was a facility that had the nurse's station right in the middle with like five different spokes going out and they did it to one wing. Uh, here's uh, uh, some photos from that study, the 6,000 Kelvin, a very blue uh, white light, the 4,100, a little more neutral, 2,700 is more of a sundown effect. There's the difference between the, the nighttime and the morning settings. Uh, this was the amber lighting they did for safety in the bathrooms. 
and the net effect of all this is they had a 41% reduction in agitation, crying, and yelling. Residents were sleeping through the night a lot better. Dramatic reduction in psychotropic and sleep medications. A 60% reduction in falls, which I think is mainly because of the uh, amber lighting they did. And the interesting side effect is residents from the other four wings were wheeling themselves over to that wing to hang out uh, in the hallways and enjoy the, the light. Um, we're going to touch briefly on lighting controls. We could do a whole hour or maybe four hours on lighting controls, but we don't have that time. Uh, the most simple lighting control, of course, is an on-off switch. And from there, we, we go to different uh, uh, degrees of complexity and cost. Uh, of course, uh, the clapper was an early example of lighting control with something other than the switch. Uh, basically, you can uh, control them through radio waves or wire uh, controls, and they can interface with uh, the phone, your tablet, or a keypad. This was a keypad with just four buttons. Um, and those four buttons can control any number of circuits. I did a uh, installation a couple years ago where we had eight circuits of lighting in this particular kitchen, and we uh, did a, uh, I think it was Radio Raw system that had a keypad at either side of the kitchen with, with uh, four buttons, and we set different scenes for different times of day. Um, with the lighting control, you can also com control fireplaces, HVAC, appliances, security system, you name it. And there are different levels of lighting control. Uh, this particular uh, chart is from Lutron, and they have a very basic entry level Cassetta uh, or Casita system. They have the Radio Raw 2, and then they have Homeworks, which has all the bells and whistles. Um, but what's particularly useful in that kind of system is the ability to control color temperature uh, to mimic daylight outside. This is from a morning uh, to evening uh, sequence. Um, light and medicine, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, there's no substitute for daylight. It's the best light out there. Everything we do with electric light is kind of a poor imitation. Uh, and this is why, if you look at this, comparison of the spectral power distribution of the sun versus different types of electric light, uh, you can see that only the sunlight is giving you what we call full spectrum. Um, incandescent, you can see, is uh, just completely one-sided to the red end of the spectrum. The CFLs were incredibly spiky, and thank goodness those are dead. Um, LEDs, they, they just showed a, a sample here. Uh, each year they're developing better versions and, uh, and some of them now mimic uh, sunlight a lot better. But any of the so-called full spectrum uh, bulbs are really not full spectrum. They don't have the spectrum of sunlight. The ancient Egyptians and Greeks used light and healing. Um, Robert Koch uh, discovered that light, sunlight kills TB. That's why you have all these historic pictures of TB clinics with the patients wheeled outside or on sun porches. Uh, Florence Nightingale discovered that wounded soldiers improve more when exposed to sunlight. Um, and light not only gets into our body through our eyes, but also through our skin. And different wavelengths have different characteristics. Um, uh, this is a standard treatment for jaundice. My son had this uh, treatment when he was soon after he was born, a blue light therapy for uh, neonatal jaundice. Uh, and sunlight has a disinfecting effect. You know, grandma might have been onto something, hanging the clothes and sheets out in the yard to dry. It's a, a powerful disinfectant and bactericide. And then with our concern about uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, a lot of correlation was shown between lack of vitamin D and uh, COVID susceptibility. So Deborah Burnett again says light is a drug, and that's true. So let's talk a bit about new research and technology as we start to wrap up the hour. Um, 
the quality of light initiatives that we're talking about and should be pay attention to are uh, terms like human centric lighting, circadian lighting, tunable white, warm dimming, spectral tuning, circadian tu tuning, uh, and many manufacturers have, have gone after this. Um, some of the top researchers, again, this is uh, Mariana Figueroa's, uh, some of her clients. Um, this was the study she did that showed after they did a, a relighting of a uh, hospital that they reduced uh, medical errors 33%. Um, Dr. George Brainerd is another top researcher from Jefferson Medical College. Um, he worked on the LED lighting for the space station um, to try to help uh, astronauts uh, function better and sleep. But you can buy this, this kind of technology uh, by the bulb at your big box store, uh, Lighting Science, uh, Philips Hue, things like that. They have uh, individual tuning, uh, tunable lamps. Um, Robert Solar is another top researcher uh, who again worked on the International Space Station. But you see a traditional 3,500 Kelvin spectral power chart versus the one with the optimized uh, skylight blue uh, that would stimulate circadian uh, response. And remember I said that windows block out the, the, the beneficial light, but there's nothing between the recessed can uh, or the fixture and uh, the user. So the electric lights in that case are probably more effective than the daylight that the person's getting. Even appliance manufacturers are paying attention. Uh, Decor has a, a, a thing on the refrigerators that if you go there in the middle of the night, there's just a very dim light on. When you open the door, it's gonna have a very dim interior lighting. Whereas if all the lights are on, it's gonna uh, be full brightness. Um, Robert Solar again with BIOS lighting um, says that most indoor lighting is inappropriate. It's too dark to be day and too bright to be night. Um, he licenses the technology to different manufacturers, but they also uh, last year marketed a, a lamp you can use on your desk that's tunable throughout the day. Um, one of the top brands uh, dealing with this technology is Ketra, which is now a part of Lutron. They have some very unique patents. Um, they do things like dimming down to one one hundredth of a percent, which is highly unusual. Um, each fixture has four red, green, blue, and white LEDs in each fixture. And it self monitors the, the quality of the light coming out. So instead of the light degrading over 10 years, it knows that it's losing red and it'll kick on another of the LEDs uh, within its uh, fixture. Uh, unlimited uh, possible colors. Um, you can wire up to 80 fixtures on 120 amp circuit. And then you control each individual fixture um, again on your phone or keypad or tablet, which is gives you incredible control. Now it's not cheap. A Ketra can with full function is about a thousand dollars a piece. Uh, they just came out this year with a, a um, just a bulb for two hundred fifty dollars that uh, that does the same thing. Um, but you can also control. Uh, you can mix and match Ketra and other uh, downlights. This is a a bulb that uh, I bought at a big box store that I can play with uh, at my desk. Uh, here's some other products. This is a very unusual light fixture it's by Colux. It's an Italian company. And uh, it looks like a skylight. You would swear it's a skylight and you're seeing the sun in the sky, but it's not, it's a light fixture. And it's designed for use in uh, interiors of buildings and basements and things like that. Um, there's another product that they use a lot in MRI rooms and things. It's a, basically a, a, a movie uh, that plays on the screen of, of sky you know, with the branches waving and the, the clouds moving and things like that. It's a very calming effect. Um, I know with, with COVID, uh, everyone was, uh, especially in the beginning when everyone thought it could be uh, transferred by touch, that everyone was wanting to sterilize everything. So they immediately went to uh, uh, UVC uh, sterilization. Um, 
and selling things like that handheld wand, which you're supposed to use to disinfect your phone or something. The trouble is, if you look into the uh, UVC light source, you can actually burn your retina. Uh, and some manufacturers are incorporating it into fixtures, down lights. In this case, it's an exhaust fan. Uh, but I would say be very careful. Uh, UVC is a great technology. It's been used for over 100 years, but mainly it's used for enclosed um, like air handler or air cleaner. Uh, sewage treatment plants use UVC disinfection a lot, uh, but for consumer use, it's not quite there. So it is um, getting time to wrap up. Um, here's what we know for sure. The, the sun is our gold standard. Let's get more daylight into our homes, into our eyes. Uh, we know that blue light uh, suppresses sleep hormones, um, that the color temperature of light matters and the intensity matters. And we ought to be giving people uh, controls for both of those. Um, and dark uh, sleep environments are terribly important. Uh, also know that children, adolescents are more acutely affected by light and uh, blue light disruption because their, their lenses are much clearer. Uh, and there's a lot more to learn. The research continues. Uh, and Deborah Burnett warns us that uh, first do no harm, um, that we, we might be causing the wrong uh, outcome uh, with the wrong choice of lighting. So be very careful. Uh, we do know that brighter days and darker nights are the goal. We need to bring more daylight into our spaces, put dimmers on everything. Um, they're very inexpensive and they give people control. Because even in the same household, the husband and wife might have a very different uh, need for light. Pay attention to color temperature uh, and pay attention to, to color rendering index too. So the color of the light and the quality of the light. Um, spectral power distribution is a, a kind of a um, step above just the correlated color temperature. Um, when possible, uh, choose tunable lamps and fixtures. They, they are becoming more and more available. I would say in 10 years that most of uh, the fixtures we do will be tunable. Right now you, you uh, have to really find, look and find them and stay tuned for new research and new products. Uh, I want to provide you some resources. Uh, here are some magazines that are free that have good lighting content. Um, uh, I would encourage you, if you're really interested in the, the topic, to join IES. Uh, it's not very expensive. American Lighting Association uh, uh, is another uh, organization, mainly of um, showrooms, that uh, has some good uh, education. Um, IALD, another associated, uh, association of lighting designers. Uh, NKBA is d doing more and more with lighting. Um, each month they do at least four webinars in May. Every year they do four, at least four webinars on lighting specifically. Uh, they also have what's called a lighting badge, which is kind of a micro credential you can earn. It's, I think it's $199 and it's a course uh, that I helped write with three other lighting professionals um, on, on this whole topic. Um, be sure to go down to the International Builder Show, Kitchen and Bath Industry Show, um, enormous number of exhibitors in the lighting field. Uh, Light Ovation is another great show. It's twice a year down in Dallas. And then the, the uh, kind of the Comic-Con for lighting people is Light Fair. And I think this coming spring, it'll be in Las Vegas. Uh, IES puts out a number of publications. This is one that I helped uh, edit and provide illustrations for called Lighting Your Way for Better Visions, CG1. It's available free from IES. Uh, and it talks about this whole topic of light for all parts of the house. Um, I was part of a committee that spent two and a half years rewriting the kitchen and bath planning guidelines for NKPA. And we have a, a new lighting section um, that talks about the need for a minimum of 50 foot candles and, and the 90 CRI color rendering index. And it has very specific illustrations on how you should lay out lighting, particularly in kitchens and baths. 
and provide different layers of lighting. Don't just provide one source, the code minimum single fixture uh, in the middle of the kitchen, which is kind of the lighting that I grew up with. Uh, here's that lighting badge I talked about. Uh, I also want to offer people a lighting handout that I am happy to send you if you just email me. I would like you to tell me one thing that you might have gotten out of this hour, and I will send it to you. But give me a little time because I may be swamped with requests. Um, here are the people that I really uh, follow uh, in terms of uh, lighting education. So I'm, I'm always trying to find new articles by them or uh, especially webinars that they offer. Uh, David Warfel in particular is one of my favorites. He calls himself uh, the chief evangelist of light. Uh, his website is lightcanhelpyou.com. He's very humorous. Uh, I like this cartoon of wafer lights, those little skinny LEDs that are just terrible. Installs in minutes, glares for decades. Uh, but if you can, uh, he's got a wonderful blog on his website uh, and also does some webinars for NKBA and other organizations. Uh, and finally, just lighting is both an art and a science. It's not all one, it's not all the other, it's a blend. And really, you have to be your own lighting expert. By all means, consult with professionals, but at some point, you're going to have to figure out what works and, uh, and use that. So with that, I wanted to say uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to, to share this information with you. And I welcome your questions either now or uh, by email. My email's there at the bottom, dougwalterarchitects at gmail.com. Great, Doug, uh, question, are a lot of those ICRI or great foot candle bulbs available in Energy Star uh, certified bulbs? Oh yes, oh yes. Okay. Um, the, now, I understand if you're just, if your only criteria is energy efficiency, um, you're probably going to get higher uh, lumens per watt out of a, um, a low CRI, high color temperature bulb. The bluer the bulb, the, the more efficient it is. Uh, you give up some of that efficiency when you introduce warm tones, but people need those warm tones. But yes, I mean... It, it's just so wonderful that we're in this uh, this decade of LEDs because it really has totally changed the game and it's made it much easier to do quality lighting. Um, you know, in the old days, if I was doing like 10 or 12 uh, recess cans in the kitchen, each of those was 75 watts and you turn those on full strength and pretty much you, you're, you're uh, keeping your pizza warm on your countertops. <laughs> so um, the LEDs run incredibly cooler. The old, uh, you, you know, MR16 bulbs, those uh, low voltage bulbs that people like to use in tracks, those run at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. Um, the LED version runs at about 120. So uh, dramatic uh, benefits. The, that's why museums in particular were so quick to jump on the LED bandwagon because it not only reduced the heat load uh, it also reduced the ultraviolet degradation because they don't emit uh, ultraviolet. Yeah. So, Doug, what's your advice for, I mean, I think you do a commercial project, you've got a lighting consultant on staff, potentially. Yes. yes. For the average home builder, what should we be looking for? What type of professional should we be seeking out to, you know, if we have a client that's concerned about this and we want to get it right? Well, by all means, reach out to uh, to find that uh, uh, professional lighting designer. Mm -hmm. uh, they're easy to find. Um, you can contact your local IES chapter uh, for a list of names. Uh, I kind of have one uh, on speed dial that I, when I get into a critical uh, client situation, like with a lot of art or something like that, I will hire him hourly to kind of look over my shoulder and make sure I'm not messing up. Um, but once you've done, you know, a few, you're going to kind of know the basic uh, parameters of how to do it right. Uh, again, you know, going to webinars like this, uh, you know, following the literature, putting a Google search uh, out there for circadian lighting, human centric lighting, uh, all that stuff is good. Fantastic. Uh, 
Well, Doug, I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. It's it's an incredible topic, and I think something that a lot of us are just starting to learn more about. But it's so critical. I love what you said of light as medicine, and it's it's so critical to uh, a healthier home generally. Well, a healthier life uh, and a safer life, and that, that's what it's all about. Is uh, you know, it, it enhances, it makes everybody look good. It, it makes the the project he did look better and it, it makes the client happier and, and safer in, in their own home. So why wouldn't you do this? Absolutely. Doug, thank you so very much. You're quite welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Doug. Great information. Do you get anything out of it, Nancy? Yeah, I learned a lot. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'll follow up with the uh, recording. Okay. You take care. You too. Bye-bye.